Okay, a new roller coaster contains a loop-the-loop -loop in which the car and the rider are completely upside down. If the radius of the loop is 13.2 meters, with what minimum speed must the car traverse the loop so the rider does not fall out while upside down at the top? Assume the rider is not strapped to the car. Okay, so I'm gonna just draw a picture of this loop-the-loop. Okay, so we're approximating it to just be a, a circle. Pretend that looked like a good circle. Let me do it again. Okay, so the rider is at the very top of the loop the loop. So what forces are acting on the rider right now? So we're going to draw a free body diagram of this rider. Thank you, Keithan. So we have a force of gravity, and force of gravity always points straight down. Is there any other force acting on the rider? Would centripetal acceleration be one? OK, so acceleration is not a force. Oh, um, sorry, not force. So, uh, so yeah, some people will say centripetal force, for example right, or radial force. So centripetal force is not a force on a free body diagram. And that's a really, really common misconception is that people think that they should put like F centripetal or something like that. And you never would put centripetal force. Basically what we've learned with circular motion and forces is that all of the forces that you're used to seeing before, when you have a circular motion problem, the sum of all those forces, when you find the net force, there will be at least a component of it that points towards the center of the circular path. And that's what causes the, the object to travel in a circular path. But there's not a special force called centripetal, centripetal force. Okay, so never put that force in there because that's kind of like an, a made up force. Um, friction, so there could be friction. So let's say the person was moving in this direction, then the force of kinetic friction would go in this direction, opposing it. But the question has makes no mention of friction. When the question doesn't mention friction, then we don't put friction in. OK. Is there any other kind of force? Normal force. And which way would the normal force be pointing? Sorry, I didn't understand that. If you want to write it again. Upwards. Upwards. So when you're in a loop the loop, right? When the rider and the car is completely upside down. So where is this surface? Oh, <laughs> your cat. So where is this surface um, of the that the object is below the object or is the surface above the object? This is my person with her hair. OK, so this is the person at the bottom of the loop-de-loop. -loop, or sorry, at the top of the loop-de-loop. -loop. So it's the person is underneath the circle. So this is the surface above. So which way is the normal force going to point? Downwards. Yeah, good. It would point this way. OK, so now if the person's going really fast, if the roller coaster is going really, really fast, this normal force is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger the faster the person's going. It's kind of like if you were to have, let's say you had a ring and you tied it to the end of a string and then you twirled the string around so that the ring was making a circular path, a vertical circle. OK, so it's basically the same idea, but this is a ring, and it's moving up and down like this in a vertical circle. OK, if you swing it around really fast, there's going to be a lot of tension. So there's a force of tension acting on it because this, there's a string attached. The tension's going to be really big, right? There's also going to be a force of gravity. The faster you swing it, the more tension's in that rope. Can you visualize that? If you were swinging it really fast, you'd feel more tension. If you swung the 
ring around slower and slower, eventually the tension starts to reduce and reduce and reduce. And eventually what happens, the ring doesn't actually make it across the circle anymore. It just kind of like flops over and falls back down. So you're trying to slow down yourself as you spin the string with the ring on it around in a vertical circle. You go slower and slower and eventually the ring doesn't even make it around the circle. It just kind of falls back down. Now there's a speed, a perfect speed or a minimum speed at which the ring will make it around the circle, just barely. So you barely swung it fast enough so that it's able to make it around the circular loop. At that exact moment, the tension is exactly zero. You have no tension in the rope. You barely just made it around. At the very top, when the ring is at the very top of the circular path, the tension zero. There's only the force of gravity acting on it. And that's the same situation that's happening with this rider on the roller coaster. When the person just barely, or the car really, just barely makes it around the loop-de-loop, -loop, okay? So it's going with a minimum speed the minimum speed that the car has when it travels the loop so that the rider doesn't fall out while they're upside down. So they make a circular path is when the normal force is zero. So there's no normal force and the only force that's acting on this object or this car is the force of gravity. And at that point, the object is traveling at the minimum speed required to get it to go over this um, like to make it flow through the circular path and traverse the circle, the loop. Make sense? If you were going any faster, then you would start to feel a normal force. Or in the case of the ring on the string, then you would start to feel tension in the string. But we want the minimum speed, which means at this point, there's only a force of gravity. There's no normal force acting on this cart. Okay, so we have um, just the force of gravity acting on this car right now, and we're trying to find out what is the minimum speed that the car must traverse the loop so that the rider doesn't fall out while upside down. Okay, so at the very minimum, um, we're gonna figure out what that speed is going to be. So right now, if that's the only force acting on the, on the car, then if we did F net, equals ma, which direction is this f net pointing in? This f force of gravity, which direction is it going? Remember, this is circular path, so we have option r, t, or z. Which direction is fg going in? r. Yeah, good, it's in the radial direction because it is pointing towards the center of the circular path. So I'm gonna put a little R here, okay, to denote that we're in the radial direction. So what is F net R then? What's my only force pointing in the radial direction? The force of gravity, mg. Yeah, good. So yeah, I'll write mg here. mg equals m. And now what are we gonna write in place of radial acceleration? We're looking for speed. Remember, we have two options for radial acceleration, v squared over r or omega squared r. v squared over r. Yeah, good. And now we're just solving for that v. So we can cancel out our masses, and we have v is equal to gr in a square root sign. OK, what planet are we on here? Earth. But if we weren't on Earth, does everybody know how to find G if you're on some other planet? Um, yeah. Remember, we have FG equals MG, and FG also equals negative G M1, M2 over R squared. And so then we can say, sorry, there's no negative sign. That was for you. So then we can say mg equals g m1 m2 over r squared and this mass cancels out with one of these masses we have little g is equal to g mass of the planet or if it was like a moon or if it was a meteor like an asteroid or whatever it is over the radius of the planet squared 
So that's the formula for little g. That formula is not given to you on the formula sheet, but the formula for fg is. So you should be able to get that formula. You're just basically getting rid of one of these masses. Okay? So if you were not on the surface of the Earth, but you were on the surface of some other planet, then you could find the little g using this. And that's how the question will get harder on the exam, is that you might just be on a different planet, so you'll have to use a different g. Okay, so then in this case, we are near the surface of the Earth, so this is just 9.8. And the radius, it tells us, is 13.2 meters. And when we type that up, we should get 11.4 meters per second. Any questions about this one before moving on? No. Okay. Okay, question 10. Okay, so we have a 7,500 kilogram truck that's traveling five meters per second east, colliding with a 1,500 kilogram car that's moving 20 meters per second in a direction that's 30 degrees south of west. After the collision, the two vehicles remain tangled together. What's the final velocity of the two vehicles? So what kind of question is this? Sure. Yep, sure. Um, there, what happened to the uh, normal force? The normal force? Okay, so we said there's no normal force because the question asks, what is the minimum speed that the car traverses the loop? And so the minimum speed occurs when there's no normal force. As soon as you start to get a normal force, that means that the car is going faster than it has to travel to travel the circular path. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, good, Uswa. So momentum and Keithan. So this is a momentum question. What kind of collision is this? Uh, um, what's it called? Inelastic. Yeah, good. This is an inelastic collision. Awesome. So, um, we have two different objects, but now this is not moving in one dimension anymore, right? This is moving in two dimensions. One object is going east, the other one's going 30 degrees south of west. So we're going to have to divide this up into the x direction and the y direction. So let's start off with the x direction. So we have object one is a 7,500 kilogram truck and it's traveling five meters per second east. And object two is a 1500 kilogram car moving 20 meters per second in a direction that's 30 degrees south of west. So be sure that you understand what 30 degrees south of west means. It means from west, you're going 30 degrees towards south. So this is 20 meters per second, 30 degrees south of west, and this object here is a 1,500 kilogram car. So if we were going to look at the x direction now, if I were to say the mass of the truck, the velocity of the truck initial, plus the mass of the car, the velocity of the car initial, is equal to the total mass because now they're stuck together. So we have the mass of the truck and the car together times the final velocity. And I'll put a little x here because we're just looking at the x direction for now. So for mass of the truck, we know it's 7,500 kilograms. The velocity of the truck, we're only talking about the x component. So what's the x component of this velocity? Five meters per second. Yeah, good. Five. And it's going to the right. We're going to say positive is to the right. Plus the mass of the car, which is 1,500. And what's the velocity of the car initially? The x component only. Um, 20 cos 30. 
Yeah, good. It's coast because it's the adjacent side. I'm just going to label that so you can see. So this is the X component and this is the Y component. Okay, so we have 20, which is our hypotenuse, cos, because it's the adjacent side that we're looking for the x component right now, 30 degrees. Is it positive or is it negative? Negative. Good, because it's pointing to the left, and we said right is positive. Equals both of the masses added together, v final x. And now we can grab our calculators and solve for v final x. And I get v final x equals 1.2799 meters per second. And it's positive, so it's going to the right. And then we can do the same thing. So I'm going to let you do the y direction. So you're going to do the same thing in the y direction. So if you have a piece of paper, just start working on the y direction now. And then when you're done, just look up and see if you're getting the same answer as me. Is anybody getting the same answer as me? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So now I know the x direction, the y direction. Since it's negative, I know it's going downwards. So now I can put them both together. So I have an x component that's going to the right, which is 1.2799 meters per second, and a y component that's going downwards. of 1.6667 meters per second. And then this is my resultant velocity. So this is my V final. So I have to find my angle so I can state my direction and also my magnitude. So I'll start with the angle. So I'll say theta is equal to the tan inverse of opposite over adjacent. And I get 52.5 degrees. And then I can solve for V final Y also. And I'm using Pythagorean theorem here. So I have a question. So the negative yeah. doesn't factor in? So the negative is the reason why my vector is pointing downwards. Okay. Yeah.
Okay, so in the end, I have V final Y is equal to 2.10 meters per second. So and then v I. V final Y or just V final? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. There shouldn't be a Y. Thanks. So V final is equal to 2.10 meters per second. And we're going east 52.5 degrees south. Or we could say 52.5 degrees south of east. It doesn't matter. Any questions about this one? So this question could be made harder. It could be, okay, so these two vehicles collide and then they crash into a spring. How much does the spring get compressed? Or then they slide up a ramp. How far up the ramp do they go? So what would you do there? Um, for the spring, we can do the um, the half kx squared equals to half mv squared. Yeah, good. So you can do a transfer of energy. So it could be um, the question can say um, these two things collide and then they crash into a spring. How much does the spring could get compressed? So then once you find the final velocity of the two objects after the collision, you can now turn it into a transfer of energy question. So you have the total energy initially, which is kinetic energy, equals the total energy final, which would be the elastic potential energy. And you can use that to find out how much the spring gets compressed. Or maybe I tell you how much it gets compressed and I want to know the K, which is the spring constant. Okay, so that's how to combine more than one concept into one question to make it a little bit harder. So the same thing for if they go up a ramp, right? Yeah, and if you're going up a ramp, it would be the same, exactly. So you say total energy initial, which would just be kinetic energy, equals the total energy final, which would be gravitational potential, because you're going up a ramp, you're changing your height. Okay. Good. Okay, so 11... A 60 kilogram astronaut becomes separated in space from her spaceship. She's 15 meters away from it and at rest relative to it. So she's at rest right now. In an effort to get back, so the spaceship is behind her. She throws a 50 or 500 gram wrench with a speed of eight meters per second in a direction away from the ship. How long does it take her to get back to the ship? So basically, this is um, the astronaut over here, and she's holding this wrench. Okay, this is my wrench. <laughs> so she's holding a wrench. She throws the wrench this way, which makes her move that way. And this is her spaceship behind her. So she's trying to get to the spaceship. And the question says, how long does it take her to get back to the spaceship? So. What kind of question is this? Transfer of energy. Okay, and what kind of energy is being transferred here? Um, like, is there a change of height or a change of velocity or a change of, like a spring that's being compressed or stretched? Uh, Think about if you had two figure skaters And they're kinetic energy. They, mm, say we have two figure skaters and they push off one of each other. And so now the two figure skaters skate away from each other, like they slide in opposite directions. What kind of question is that? When it pushes off, I feel, is it elastic? Elastic what? What do you mean? Uh, potential, elastic potential energy. Oh, energy? No, that's a, that would be a spring. So there would have to be a spring in the question. What if we had um, a firecracker and it exploded into three pieces? Was it a momentum question? 
Yeah, these are all momentum questions. So basically, initially, everything's at rest. And then there's this collision. It's kind of like a backwards collision, a collision in reverse, which is sort of like an explosion. You have uh, two figure skaters that push off each other. Initially, they're both at rest. And then one moves to the left, the other one moves to the right. It's like a collision kind of in reverse right? They kind of collide off each other. They push off of each other. Or you have a firecracker and it explodes into three pieces. That's kind of like a collision, but it's in reverse. Like it started off together and then it exploded. This is the same thing. You have an astronaut holding a wrench. She throws a wrench in one direction and she moves the other direction. It's just like the two figure skaters who push off of each other. Or another example is like, let's say you're in a canoe and you jump off the canoe this way, well, which way is the canoe going to go? Backwards, man. Yeah, the opposite way. That's a momentum problem. It's conservation of momentum. Initially, everything's at rest, though, in all of these cases. So assuming everything was at rest. So initially, everything's at rest. One object goes in the positive direction. The other object goes in the negative direction. OK, so this is what's happening to the, the astronaut and her wrench. So she throws the wrench forward, making her move backwards. It's a momentum question. So initially, the velocity of the astronaut is what? Before she throws the wrench? Zero. Zero. And the velocity of the wrench initially? At rest. Yeah, good. Also zero. And then the mass of the astronaut is given 60 kilograms. And the mass of the wrench, yeah, good, it has to be changed, perfect, to kilograms. Okay, and then the final velocity of the wrench is given. Velocity of the wrench, final. What's that value? Eight, eight yeah, per good, eight meters per second. We can say it's positive or negative. It just depends on how we want to define the positive direction. So we can say it's going away from the ship. And we could say towards the ship is positive. So away from the ship would be negative if we wanted to. Let's do that. Away from the ship. So towards ship equals positive, away equals negative. So that's why it's negative. And then we're looking for the velocity of the astronaut final. Once we know the velocity of the astronaut, and we know that the ship is 15 meters away from her, we know the velocity of the astronaut, we know how far away she has to travel to get to the ship. How are we going to find out how long it takes for her to get back to the ship? What's the assumption we need to make here? The velocity is constant. Good. We have to assume that there's no acceleration. She's in the she's in a spaceship. She's in space and she's not accelerating in any direction. And so her velocity is constant. So once we find the velocity, we can just sub it into a kinematic equation to find out how long it takes for her to get back to her ship. So we can say mass of the astronaut, velocity of the astronaut initial plus mass of the wrench, velocity of the wrench initial equals mass of the astronaut, velocity of the astronaut final plus mass of the wrench, velocity of the wrench final. And we're solving for the velocity of the astronaut final. So let's just rearrange now. So is it, is it necessary for us? Do we have to like rearrange during the exam? Nope, you don't need to rearrange. Like if you want to plug in the numbers first and then rearrange, that's up to you. Some people prefer to rearrange first because then they're not putting in all these numbers right away. They're only putting the numbers in once. It's up to you, okay? Okay, okay so VA initial is zero plus the mass of the wrench.
So the velocity of the astronaut final, I'm just going to put five significant digits in. 0 0.066667 meters per second. And so now the distance that the astronaut needs to travel is 15 meters. And we're going to assume that her acceleration is zero. And we get 225 seconds. So it takes her 225 seconds to finally make it back to her spaceship. So I would say the hardest part about this problem is to recognize the type of problem that it is, that this is a conservation of momentum problem. So sometimes that's not always so obvious because you don't always think of um, this as a collision. Just like two ice skaters who push off of each other, we don't always consider it as a collision or a firecracker that explodes into pieces, okay? But it's still a conservation of momentum problem. It's almost like a collision in reverse. It's like as if you went back in time, the firecracker exploded or it it started off in three pieces and then it collided into each other going backwards. Okay, so these are all momentum problems. If I told you where the closest planet was here, and what the mass of the, the planet was, then you'd also be able to figure out what little g is, which would be the acceleration. So it wouldn't be zero. But in this case, we're assuming she's in the middle, like she's in outer space and there is no um, planet close by. And so that's why we're just making the assumption that there is like that acceleration due to gravity is negligible. Well, so if there was a planet close by, even though she's not on it, we have to factor that in. Yeah, if I gave you information about a planet, just like if you were close to the planet Earth, right, and she was falling towards her spaceship, then she would be falling towards it. And then in that case, you would use G to find out what the, her acceleration is due to gravity. Okay, the next question. This question some of you might have seen on the test. If you're looking for more problems to do, start going through the different versions of the tests too. So you have all the problems from the lectures, right? You have the practice quiz, like the, uh, the practice exam, which is quiz 2324, all the lecture problems, and then all your tests. So all the tests are posted. There's four versions of each test. So each of those versions have slightly different problems. So you can look at them. This is one that's similar to one of the problems on one of the tests. So Shafiq has a mass of 40 kilograms, jumps on top of a bobsled. With the bobsled, he slides down a ramp and it collides into a spring that has a spring constant of 2,000 newtons per meter. If he leaps on the bobsled with a speed of 12 meters per second, how far will Shafiq compress the spring? What kind of question is this? energy on that momentum which one is there a collision here yes so it's shafiq colliding with the bobsled that part is a collision and then when the bobsled and shafiq slide down the ramp and compress the spring what part is that what kind of question is that transfer of energy yeah, good. So this is a two-part question. It's a collision and a transfer of energy.
Okay, so we can divide it up into two parts. So part A is a collision. For all collisions, we've got conservation of momentum. Okay, so we have Shafiq. So we have the mass of Shafiq, velocity of Shafiq initially, plus the mass of the bobsled, velocity of the bobsled initially, equals, what kind of collision is this? In the last one. Yeah, good, so they're stuck together. So we have the mass of Shalik, Shafiq and the bobsled together times the final velocity. And then we're solving for the final velocity, which is just the velocity that they have when they're at the top of the hill here. Okay, so that's what we're gonna find first. So I'm gonna rearrange to solve for that. Or you can plug in your numbers right now if you'd rather do that. And we know the masses and we know his initial velocity was 12. The mass of the bobsled was 20 kilograms. And what's the initial velocity of the bobsled? Zero. Yeah, good. Okay, so here I'm getting eight meters per second. That's their velocity now that they're stuck together. Okay, so here he is on the bobsled and they have a velocity of eight meters per second. And now we wanna know how far is this spring gonna get compressed? So we're moving on to part B, which is energy conservation of energy. Okay, so now for conservation of energy, we're gonna say the total energy initially when they're at the top. So when they're at the top of the ramp here, the total energy is equal to the total energy final, which means when they're down here, compress the spring to its maximum amount. That's what the final is. So initially, what kind of energy do they have? Remember, there's the three types. Yeah, I'm just going to write them all in. So are there any of these types of energy that we can cross out initially? Feel free to enter in the chat if you don't feel comfortable speaking as well. Any type of energy initially that we can cross out because it's zero. Elastic, good. Initially, the spring is not stretched or compressed, so there is no elastic potential energy. So that's gone. Thanks, Naya. And then final, when the two of them, the bobsled with um, this, the person is on the bobsled. When two, the two of them come down and compress the spring, what kind of energy exists at the end? Um, elastic potential. Yeah, good. There's no kinetic energy. And if we say that the height is zero at the bottom here, there's no... then there's no gravitational potential either. Good, so now we can put in our formulas. So kinetic energy, the formulas are given on the formula sheet. Okay, note that in this problem, for the entirety of the whole problem, the objects are close to the surface of the earth, which is why we can use UG equals MGH. And we don't have to use that longer equation for UG, the negative um, G M1 M2 over R equation. Okay, so now we have the initial velocity 
First, the mass of both of them together was 60 kilograms. The initial velocity was eight. We found that from the collision part of the question. The mass is 60, G is 9.8. What about the initial height? It's a 50 meter long spring. I mean, sorry, a 50 meter long ramp. And we're looking for this height over here. Fifty sine twenty. Yeah, good. Fifty sine twenty degrees because it's the opposite side. Equals one half. The k value was given in the question two thousand. And then we're just looking for this delta x here. So we can just type everything in and rearrange and solve for delta x. So go ahead and do that. I'll do it as well, and then we'll compare. I got a different answer than what's up above here, so I'm just going to recheck my numbers again. I'm going to type them up again. I got 3.46. Yeah, that's what I got. So I think there was just a mistake here. 3.46, yeah. So delta x equals 3.46 meters. I'll just change that here. Okay. All right. And that's it. Okay, so two problems in one, basically. You have a collision and a conservation of energy. Any questions here? No. Okay, so move on to 13. Okay, a crane lifts a 425 kilogram steel beam vertically, a distance of 117 meters. How much work does the crane do on the beam if the beam accelerates upward at 1.8 meters per second squared? Neglect friction. Okay, so here's my beam. I'm just gonna draw it as a little dot and the crane is lifting it up vertically. So what are the forces that are acting on this beam? Feel free to use the chat too. Um, gravity. Okay, so gravity points straight Normal. down. Normal force. Okay, so the beam is not resting on a surface. The beam is being lifted by a crane. FT, good. Okay, so we can call it FT because we're assuming the crane is attached to a rope that's pulling up on um, the beam. So that's perfect. Or if we want, we can just call it force of the crane. I'm just going to call it force of the crane. But yes, you're, you're right. If you want to put in force of tension, that's also right because, of course, a crane would use a rope to pull up the beam. Okay, so I'm just going to call it the force of the crane just because the question wants to know how much work does the crane do? So when we're looking for the work done, what's the formula for work? So we want to know the work done by the crane would equal, what's the formula? I'll write down the equation for work. Work is always equal to the force times the displacement traveled times coast 
of the angle between the force and the displacement. So I'm going to call that the beta at angle. The angle I'm going to call beta, which is the angle between the force and the displacement. Now, if I'm looking for the work done by the crane, the force would be then the force of the crane. Okay, so we need to know what the force of the crane is so we can put it in this equation. It says that it's lifting, the crane is lifting the beam a distance of 117 meters. So that delta S then would be 117 meters. And which way is the crane, like what the direction that the force is going is up and the direction that the beam is moving is also up. So the direction of F is up and the direction of delta S is also up. So what would the beta be then? What would be the beta? We have a force that's going up. Not quite 90 degrees. The force is going up and the delta S is also going up. What's the angle between those two vectors? 180. 180 would be like this. But what if we have one force like this and another force like this? Oh, yes. Zero. Yes, good night. Good job, both of you. Okay, so that's right, it would be zero. So that beta is zero degrees. If the force and is acting in the same direction that the object is actually moving, that's when that beta is gonna be zero. And what's cos of zero? What is cos of zero? One. Sorry about that. I left you guys by accident. <laughs> I'm just going to present again. So my question that I asked you before I left was, what is cos of zero? One. Yeah, one. Good. So can you see this the screen that has um, a crane lifts a 425 kilogram steel beam? Can you see that question? Awesome. Thank you. OK. So before we can finish this question now, we need to just know what the FC is, the force of the crane. So we have a free body diagram. And the question tells us that the beam accelerates upwards at 1.8 meters per second squared. How are we using this information to get the force of the crane? How does a free body diagram help us figure out our acceleration? What's the equation that relates free body diagrams with acceleration? F net. Yeah, good. Most of the time when you're drawing a free body diagram, it's because you're gonna use F net equals MA. Now this time we know the A. What's our F net gonna be according to the free body diagram? Which way are we gonna say is the positive direction? Upwards. Upwards, because the crane is moving upwards. So what's the F net? F crane minus FG, perfect. So we have the force of the crane minus the force of gravity equals MA. We're solving for the force of the crane. So we're gonna bring the force of gravity to the other side. So MA plus force of gravity is just MG. So we have the mass, which is 425 the acceleration, which was 1.80 plus the mass, 425. We're assuming we're near the surface of the Earth, so G is 
So I'm getting my force of the crane is 4930 newtons. So now I can do the work done by the crane. The work done by the crane is equal to the force of the crane, which is 4930 newtons, times the displacement of the beam, which is 117 meters, times cos of the angle between the force and the displacement, which was zero degrees. So I'm just going to type that up. And I get 576810. The units for work is joules, and I have too many significant digits, so I'm just going to round, so I can round it so I only have three digits, five, seven, seven, zero, zero, zero joules. Or I could write 5.77 times 10 to the 5 joules. When you input your number in Blackboard, you can just write 577000 joules. Okay, so if the question asks you how much work was done, you need to know what the force is first, and then times that by the displacement, and then cos of the angle between the force and the displacement. Any questions about 13? No. Okay, so we'll move on to 14. Okay, so it's possible that you're going to see a question or two that doesn't have any numbers in it, just like this one. So I wanted to post, pose one like this as well. So there's no numbers, everything's in variables, so it means you're forced to rearrange everything to solve for what you're looking for um, without any numbers. So you don't have an option to plug in numbers here. So we have a block that has a mass of M, starts from rest at a height H, it slides down a frictionless incline. So here's my block. Slides down the frictionless incline across a rough horizontal surface of length L. So this is my rough surface here. And then up a frictionless incline. The coefficient of kinetic friction on the rough surface is mu k. How high does the block go on the second incline? So I'm looking for this final height here. Give your answers in terms of M, H, L, mu, K, and G. What kind of question is this? Feel free to type it in the chat too. Transfer of energy. Good. So it's a conservation of energy where we can say E total initial equals E total final. But there's something else going on here. The only time you can say energy is conserved in a problem is if there's no external forces acting on a system. Is there an external force here? No. There is one. It talks about friction across a horizontal surface of length L. It says the coefficient of kinetic friction on the rough surface is mu k. There is friction. This is an external force. Anytime there's an external force, what do you need to add to your equation? You can't just say E total initial equals E total final. You need to add something to the left side. What is it that we need to add here? Yes, work. Good. And in this case, it's the work done by what kind of force? What's the external force? Friction. Yeah, good. Work done by friction. So we need to include work in this equation. So we can do E total initial equals E total final, but we have to add work because in this case, 
energy is being added. In this case, it's actually negative energy because the work done by friction is negative since it always opposes the motion. Fr the force of friction opposes the motion. So it's doing negative work on the object, but it's taking away energy from the system. So our E total initial doesn't equal our E total final anymore. We need to include that work term. So E total initial. So we're gonna say the height is zero at the bottom. And the initial height here is just H. Okay, so what kind of energy do we have when we're at the top, so initially? What kind of energy is there initially when the block is at the top of this ramp? Just gravitational, good. So I'm gonna say UG initially, it tells you it's starting off at, from rest. So that's why there's no kinetic energy. Now we're going to put in our work equation. So remember, work done by friction, the formula is the force. So in this case, it would be the force of friction, kinetic friction, times the displacement, times cos of the angle between the force of kinetic friction and the displacement. So on this bumpy surface here, the object is moving to the right. That's the direction of our delta S. What's the direction of our force, our force of friction? to the left. Yeah, good. So what's the angle between these two forces? Good, 180 degrees, perfect. So now we have cos of 180 degrees equals E total final. So now this is our final position over here when we're at the top of the ramp again. What kind of energy does it have? Potential energy. Good, gravitational potential. So we have UG final. So here's our equation for gravitational potential initial. It's, it's MGH initial plus, okay, our force of kinetic friction. How do we find our force of kinetic friction? So if we were to draw free, this free body diagram, so here's our bumpy surface, here's our object at the bottom. So we only care about it when it's on this surface because that's where there's friction. We have a force of gravity, we have a normal force, and we have a force of kinetic friction. How do we solve for that force of kinetic friction? What does Fg equal? Mg. What does the normal force equal? Hello? Yep. Can you I hear me? Your, I can't see your screen. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay, so what does the F normal equal? So there's only two forces that have a Y component, FG and F normal. And the object's not accelerating in the Y direction. So those two forces need to cancel out. So what does F normal? Yeah, it equals MG. And then what does FK equal? Mu K. FK equals just Mu K by itself? F and Mu K. Yeah, so it's mu k times the normal force, which is mg. Okay, so the force of kinetic friction is the coefficient times the normal. And we said the normal has to cancel out with the force of gravity, so it equals mg. Okay, so now we know what to put in for fk. So it equals mu k mg times delta s. And what's cos of 180? Mm. Minus one. Yeah, good. It's negative one. So instead of writing negative one here, I'm just going to write minus equals UG final. So it's MGH final. And we're looking for this expression of H final. Okay, so, so the block. MG cancel. Um, the MG, yeah. So there's an MG in all of the terms, right? So that's a great point. So let's start canceling things. So the MG is in all the terms. So we could cancel them all out. 
Okay, so the initial height was h. So that's just h minus mu k. Delta s is um, this length right here. Okay, because that's where the force of friction is being applied. And the delta s, they tell us in the question, the length is l. So we're going to call it l. That's how long that portion of the um, path is where there's friction equals h final. So we're just solving for h final. We're already done. h final is h minus mu k times l. And that's our answer. So are you going to get a question like this on the final where there's no values? You just have to write the equation. Yeah, there could be a question like this. Do you find these ones harder no, when there's exactly. no numbers? They shouldn't be harder because you're just rearranging the letters and you just don't have to plug in any numbers. So it's actually easier. You don't have to type anything on your calculator. Okay. Okay, let's try to get through one more question right now, number 15. And then the remaining questions, 16 onwards, have a video solution in the end. So you can just do them all on your own and then watch the video to make sure you're doing them correctly. Okay, so we have a uniform solid sphere rolling without slipping along a horizontal surface with a speed of 5.5 meters per second when it starts up a ramp that makes an angle of 25 degrees with the horizontal. So initially, the velocity is 5.5 meters per second. Okay, what is the speed of the sphere after it's rolled three meters up the ramp measured along the surface of the ramp? So along the surface of the ramp, we've moved three meters from here to here. And so at this point over here, we want to know what is the speed of the sphere. So what kind of question is this? Feel free to type it in the chat if you like or speak out loud. Conservation of energy. Good. So we have E total initial equals E total final. So initially we're down here. What kind of energy do we have? Potential energy. So gravitational potential, are you saying? Yes. We're going to say at the bottom of this ramp here, we have a height of zero. And we are trying to. So when we're at the bottom, we don't have a height. So, so we do have, we still have? Um, kinetic energy. Yeah, good. So E K initial equals at the top when we're at this height here. What kind of energy do we have? What kind of energy do we have there? Um, potential, gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential, good. Because we do have a height now. Do we have any other kind of energy? Mm, no. So the question says, what is the speed of the sphere after it's traveled three meters up the ramp? So we're looking for the speed. So what kind of energy does it have if it has a speed? Kinetic. Yeah, good. So it does have EK final. A lot of times the question will say, how far up the ramp will the, the ball travel? So in that case, you're assuming it came to a stop and then it doesn't have kinetic energy. But here it's asking how far is it, I mean, how fast is it moving when it's traveled three meters up the ramp? So it has gravitational potential and it also has kinetic energy. Any questions about that? No. 
Okay, so initially has kinetic energy, so I'm going to put in the equation, one-half mv initial squared. At the end, it has kinetic energy, mv final squared. And at the end, it has gravitational potential energy, mg h final. Okay, so we can rearrange and solve for v final. So we're going to say v final is equal to mv initial squared minus 2 mgh final over m in the square root sign. And then we can start to cancel out any, any variables that cancel. So this mass, they can all go away. OK, so now we just need to know what we're plugging in for everything. So initially, the velocity was 5.5. G is 9.8, because we're assuming we're near the surface of the Earth. What about the final height? What are we putting in for the final height? Um, um, 3 to 25. Yeah, good. Perfect. And then all in a square root sign. And we get 3.54 meters per second. Did I do anything wrong? Actually, that number doesn't give me 3.54. I can type it up. So I want people to look at my solution and think if there's anything wrong. And I'll give you a clue. There is something wrong. I want you to find it. Um. We aren't using the inertia equations. Why do we need to be using inertia equations? What do you mean by that? Because we put us a solid sphere. Yes, you see that it says it's a solid sphere? We're not treating this like a particle anymore. We're treating it like a solid sphere that's rolling, rotating up the ramp. So when we talk about kinetic energy, initial and final, what kind of kinetic energy does this sphere have? Do you remember the two types of kinetic energy? Rotational and what's the other kind? Translational. Translational, good. Perfect. Now, what kind of kinetic energy does the sphere have? Rotational. It's because it's rotating up the ramp. Yeah. Is it also translating? Yes, because it's moving. Well. Yeah, the center of mass of the sphere is also moving up the ramp. So it's not just rotating, it's rotating and translating. So our equation needs to include both rotational kinetic energy and translational. OK, so it's very common to miss this bit, but it's really important. So we have E kinetic rotational and E kinetic translational. That's initial. Final, you also have rotational and translational. And you also have a change in height, so you have UG final. So when we're putting in our formulas for rotational kinetic energy, instead of 1 half mv squared, it's 1 half i omega squared. For translational, it's the regular mv squared. So I'll put that in for both. And then mgh. So we're talking about a solid sphere. So does anybody know what the moment of inertia is of a solid sphere? It's 2 over 5 mr squared. So I'll put that in. So we have 1 half. The i is 2 over 5 mr squared. And we don't know the omega, but we do know the v. So we know the formula v equals omega r. So rather than omega, we're going to change it to be V over R.
The eye is still the same in the final side. And then for omega, again, we're looking for the final velocity, not the angular velocity. So we're looking for V. So we have V final over R squared plus 1 half MV final squared plus MGH final. Now we can go ahead and start canceling things. There's some R's that could get canceled out, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So I have R squared here, and I have R that's being squared also here, so those cancel out. Same with these R squareds, they cancel out. And then I have lots of masses that could cancel. I have a mass, a mass, mass, and mass, and mass. As long as there's mass in every single term, you can cancel them all out. So now I have 1 half times 2 fifths, so that's, 2 over 10 v initial squared plus 1 half v initial squared equals, oh, sorry, I'm going to replace that with just saying 1 over 5, so it's nicer. 1 over 5. And then on the right side, my 2s can cancel, so I get 1 over 5 v final squared plus 1 half v final squared plus G H final, and I'm solving for that um, V final. So we'll put these together. One fifth plus one half is like saying um, two tenths plus five tenths, which is seven tenths. V initial squared equals, on the right side, it's the same thing, seven tenths V final squared plus G H final. So I'm looking for that V final squared, or that V final. So I have V final is equal to 10 over 7 times 7 over 10 V initial squared minus G H final, all in a big square root sign. Any questions there, how I'm getting that? I brought the GH final to the other side, and then I times both sides by 10 over 7 to get rid of this 7 over 10. Okay, so now I can just start plugging everything in. 10 over 7, 7 over 10. My V initial was 5.5. I'm noticing people are requesting to view something. It's probably the video from the last lecture. Um, I'm guessing I probably didn't give you sharing rights, so I'm going to go and do that right after and finish this problem, okay? So I'll go, I'll open it up so anybody with the link can view it. Sorry about that. Okay, so V initial squared minus G, and then we already said H final was 3 sine 25. So it's really, really important that we remember when something um, is rotating that we include rotational kinetic energy in our formula. Yep, and I'm getting 3.54 meters per second.